talk at MLFL today. She is currently a professor of computer science at Brown. She did a lot of really insightful, cool stuff about natural language inference in her PhD, and uh, which she's hopefully going to talk about. And she's going to tell us why we should care about linguistics. So please uh, welcome Professor Ellie Pavlik. Right, is this working? Is it good? Okay, cool. I've been warned it might start giving feedback and then I'll frantically adjust. Um, but cool, yeah, thanks for coming. I'm super excited to be in the like, I was just saying, I feel like I know so many of the people here and talk to so many people, uh, but I've never actually visited, so I'm really excited to be here. Um, and I'm going to give a talk I gave at Star Sound this past year about uh, NLP and linguistics and kind of what I view as like why these are converging on the same field, basically. Um, so in case, just so we're all on the same page, I think everyone knows that deep learning has kind of taken over the field of NLP right now. Um, and this is like not for no reason. So like about five years ago, there was this wave of studies where you could basically, basically show you could take any of the core tasks that we care about in NLP, um, things like sentiment analysis and parsing, or speech tagging, or what have you, and to just replace your conventional classifier with a neural net and just get consistent performance um, boosts on that. Um, so this is all uh, nothing new. So the kind of thing that's changed in the past year or so, just a little over that, um, is that when you start digging into these like really exciting results, then the picture gets a little more blurry. So people have started asking like, where are these improvements coming from, and what are these systems actually learning? Um, and there you start seeing that just a huge wave of negative results. So um, a paper I published with my advisor in last year, my PhD, we were looking at uh, modifier noun compositions, and we basically showed that for these really simple types of just adding a modifier that should be um, applicable in this context, um, the systems could not recognize this as entailment, and they were basically performing at random guessing um, on these types of inferences that required what seemed like pretty simple common sense inferences. Um, there was a paper by Percy Lang's group uh, the following year that showed that if you take these question answering systems, um, which like read a passage and produce an answer, and you just add some random sentence into the passage unrelated to the answer, then the systems lost about half of their accuracy. Um, there was a similar study at ACL this past year that showed um, that you could break the inferences with these uh, lexical entailments. So if I uh, replaced a word like saxophone with a similar word like lecture the system would think that this was an entailment just because the words were similar. Um, and a similar type of result for negations, right? So, and actually there's just been, like I said, a ton of these. Like it's become uh, so easy, it's not even fun anymore to come up with these like gotcha examples of like, look, your deep learning system doesn't capture this specific linguistic phenomenon. Um, and so this is what I kind of picture the state of our world is right now, is we have uh, deep representations which are really good at tasks, and they're just very bad at anything that we think of as being what we want a representation of language to capture. Um, and so this, I think, is kind of a really significant question that's worth dwelling on, which is, should we really care about this discrepancy, like about this situation? Like, is it important that these systems are bad at these linguistics tasks if they're doing well at the tasks that we care about? Um, because for a long time, and I actually remember being in multiple discussions uh, along these lines early in my PhD, which um, basically defended uh, NLP as primarily an engineering field or an engineering discipline where people would say, let's not quibble about what the right representation is. Let's just say the right representation is whatever allows us to do the tasks that we care about. So if I'm going to build a machine translation system, I'm not going to first try to decide what do I need to do to represent language. I'm just going to use whatever allows me to translate, or whatever allows me to do information retrieval. And that kind of task-driven philosophy is really nice because you get to avoid a lot of really hard questions. You can just say, let's optimize for downstream performance. And we've been doing that really well, but then we get this unsatisfying result where we see that it's really easy to break these systems on these, um, on these trivial perturbations of the input, right? Um, and so there's, I think, been the shift towards uh, something different that's not task-driven, um, just use whatever representation allows you to do well on a task, and then that kind of changes what it is we care about these representations. So specifically, I'm thinking about this uh, shift towards this notion of general purpose sentence representations. So this is um, excerpt from the 
website of the Breath of Val workshop from a couple years ago, um, which was on representation learning, and kind of the stated mission here was that um, we want to build these general purpose representations of language, um, and that these representations capture broadly useful features of language, so not just the features that are needed for translation, or needed for summarization, or needed for retrieval, but just features of language broadly construed. Um, and then that, that same representation can be applied across a lot of downstream tasks, right? Um, and so I think this is a really significant shift because we're no longer saying we can optimize for a specific task, but we want a representation that works well on all the tasks we currently have and all the tasks that don't even exist yet, but that we might at some future point want to use a system of natural language understanding for. Um, and so this is what I think brings us very much in close alignment with the pursuit that linguistics has been um, focusing on kind of since the beginning, which is this notion that we can codify language in all of its glory and all of the meaning in some mathematical representation that can explain its behavior and its use across context. So a uh, quote from Richard Montague, who we kind of think of as the father um, of formal semantics, um, kind of famously stating that there isn't actually a meaningful difference between human language, natural language, and languages of logicians and mathematicians and computers, um, and that it's possible to like codify all of linguistic meaning into some mathematical theory. And then there's been this uh, kind of debate on if we're translating language into math, um, are we using something like first order logic or something like lambda calculus, which is what the linguists tend to use and what older NLP models tend to use, or are we using something like linear algebra, which is what we're using now, so this is obviously different and, uh, and kind of presented as like this big dichotomy that exists between which of these mathematical representations um, is the correct one, but I think it overlooks the kind of unifying assumption, which is that we can do this, that we can take language and we can put it into something that is precise and reproducible across use cases and across contests and tasks. Um, and doing this translation opens up a huge can of worms. Like, if we actually want to do this in a general purpose way, figuring out how to do this translation is hard and requires making some really fundamental decisions. Um, that to some extent might need to be made before we even decide what the mathematical representation is that we are using. Um, so I'm thinking of kind of some of the famous questions that come up when we talk about, for example, representations of a word. So you can think about, uh, we need a representation for the word Obama, some entity, it's probably a vector because what else is it going to be? Um, and so you can say, well, do you want this representation to contain the information that Obama is a person? And I think most people would say, yeah, it seems weird to say that your system knows the meaning of Obama but doesn't know that he's a person. Um, then you could say something about, like, what about the fact that he was the US president? People would say, like, yeah, that seems really core to the meaning of Obama. You can't really say that you understand Obama without knowing these facts about uh, who he is and what he's done. Um, but should it contain every piece of information about him? Because there's a lot of facts that are tr maybe true. I don't know if this is true. I didn't do that much research on the slides. But um, there's uh, going to be a ton of facts that are true about him uh, that many people would say they know the meaning of Obama, but they don't know whether those are true. So should that be built into a representation, or is that something that's acquired elsewhere? And if so, where is it acquired and where is it represented in stored? Um, and that's for things like entity vectors or entity representations, which are kind of, to some extent, easier to think about. Um, you can think of more of the function word type of representation, so vector for and. Um, I think uncontroversially, uncontroversially, <laughs> that right? um, people would agree that it should have the conjunction sense, so peanut butter and jelly, um, but it's more controversial whether it should contain this kind of uh, causal sense that people often use for and. So I went to the beach and got sunburned. Um, you could, most people won't interpret this as a conjunction of two independent events, but they'll uh, interpret it as I'm saying I got sunburned as a result of having gone to the beach. And so should that sense be built into the representation of and, or is that acquired elsewhere um, at runtime, like in context? Um, and we have to figure out uh, which of those is the case. Um, and if it's acquired elsewhere, where it's acquired. And again, because we're not doing these things in a task-dependent way, we can't necessarily defer this decision to downstream, right? We need to have some way of deciding whether we have the right representation now, um, or whether this is something that's going to be dealt with later. Um, and then you can think of even more difficult to conceptualize types of words that are just inherently context-dependent and referential, like the meaning of the word here. How are we going to acquire this meaning, and how are we going to represent it? Um, and how are we going to know when the meaning we have is the right one? Right. Um, and so again, 
I emphasize that. I think this is significant because when these discussions used to come up, even like five or six years ago, the answer was always, it's whatever representation allows you to do the task well. But now we want to do this in a general purpose way, and we don't know what future tasks we care about. So deciding what models we want to build and how we're going to know when the representation we have is the right one are really fundamental hard questions that I think we're just beginning to, um, to realize are questions we have to answer. And so I've been thinking of this as kind of this epic crossroads that NLP is at right now because we're the kind of methods and the mantras that we've been using about how we train and evaluate models. Um, we want to be empirical, but the way that we do that um, is very different and feels much more basic science-y than how it has been in the past. Um, and so on the one hand, we can think about doing this in a kind of bottom-up way. Um, so that would be, we come up with a theoretical model of how we think language works, and then we try to instantiate that with some a uh, computational representation. Or we can go the other direction where we say, let's build the representations that we currently have, and then let's kind of see where they break, and then try to fix that. And we can kind of iterate on this and hopefully converge on the right representation. Um, and I think there's merits to both of these. There's also risks to both of these. So on the bottom up side, you kind of run this risk of becoming very philosophical and just sitting and debating like what exactly the meaning of the word and should be, and never actually having practical impact or building systems that actually work. Um, on the other side, if you do the top-down approach, you run this risk of feeling like you're always like one hyperparameter away from the right representation, and you can kind of get stuck in this like local minimum, right? And then we don't actually have this ability to explore different representations and go back to the drawing board if that's what's needed. Um, so I will just admit that I fall kind of on this side. This is the approach that I think um, I prefer to take at the risk of falling it off into the too philosophical world. Um, but I do think that there's a healthy balance and that we have people working from both sides and I think we're gonna meet in the middle and come up with something good um, in trying to do this new non like general purpose uh, representation learning. Um, so this talk will be taking a bottom up approach. Uh, so, which means I'm gonna start by talking about set theory semantics and actually most of the talk will be uh, more on the linguistic side, I think, or just not, I'm not actually a linguist, so I'll just like put that out there because linguists have a lot of reasons to not like things or tell me how much I don't understand things, and that's probably true. So I'll just say this is like from a computer scientist standpoint, linguists, right, or linguistics. Um, and I want to talk about kind of the pencil and paper modeling of language, not necessarily the computational model of language. It, because I think this is this important, important first step to trying to build these computational representations. Um, so if we say, okay, I want to build a model of, or start with the model of how I think language works and then try to instantiate that computationally, and then that will help us build these general purpose representations. The logical place to start is with set theoretic semantics because that kind of forms the foundation of most of the linguistic theories that we have, or most of the ones that are actually in, like uh, widely accepted and wide use. Um, and so specifically, most of the work I've been doing in uh, modeling semantics has been on looking at modifier and compositions. So this notion of be, um, like whether beach entails sandy beach in specific contexts. Um, so I'll focus on that problem. And this is the problem I alluded to earlier that, uh, that current models were not handling very well. Um, so as a kind of general overview, the notion we have in set theoretic semantics is that we have language, which are like symbols on a page, like the word beach, and then we have things in the world that that language can refer to, so actual beaches in the world. Um, and critically, there's this kind of uh, separation between these two. So we have language and we have the world, but there's a line so that language serves as an abstraction over which we can talk about the world. And so we can reason about language without having to observe the actual world to which it refers. Um, so we can say the meaning of beach is the set of all the beaches in the world. Um, and we can abstract this away and just say that the meaning of beach is a set. Um, and this set refers to things in the world, but we can just think about it in terms of referring to a set. Um, and then when we have modifiers, these also refer to sets because they're also now crazy. So we have the set of beaches, we have the set of sandy beaches, tropical beaches, snowy beaches, etc. Um, and these are all different sets of objects in the world. And then when we talk about modifiers, um, we can categorize them in terms of the relationships between the sets that are denoted by the original word beach and the modifier like sandy beach. Um, so uh, <coughs> specifically here, we would say that uh, a sandy beach entails beach because everything that falls into the set of sandy beaches is within the set of beaches. Or sandy beach is a subset of beach. 
Um, and we would call Sandy subsective here because of this relationship, because Sandy Beach is a subset of the beaches. Um, now, not all modifiers are subsective, so formal linguistics would give us three kind of basic categories for the types of modifiers um, that we use. So we could also have uh, what we call non-subsective or plain non-subsective modifiers. This would be something like so-called. So you would say here the set of so-called beaches is uh, overlapping with but not a subset of the set of beaches. So we can have some so-called beaches that are like, okay, fine, it's a beach, but it's like on the board, it's like a so-called beach. Um, and then you can have other ones that's like, reportedly a beach, but is decidedly not a beach. Like your friend's like, hey, come over, I hang out at my beach this weekend, and you're like, that is not a beach. Um, but he claimed it was a beach, so it's a so-called beach. Um, so that would be uh, plain non subsective And then we also have primitive modifiers where the meaning of, uh, and this would be like imagined or fake, um, so the meaning of imagined beach is distinctly disjoint from the meaning of beach. Um, so this would be like some beach that you go to in your meditation app or something, but it is definitely not an actual beach in the world. Um, and this is what we call primitive modifiers. Um, so this is the kind of, at a high level, the landscape we get for thinking about modifiers in the kind of formal set theoretic semantics. We have uh, the main takeaways being that noun phrases refer to sets that includes basic noun phrases and modifier noun um, compositions, that the modifiers can be classified according to the relationship between the set referred to by the noun by itself and the set referred to by the modified noun, um, and that the relationship between these sets determines the inferences we make about them. So I infer if you say, um, do you want to come hang out at my so-called beach <laughs> this weekend, which I don't know what you would say that way. Someone else would say, like, do you want to hang out at so-and-so's so-called beach this weekend. Um, I wouldn't necessarily infer that it was actually a beach, and that is because so-called has this denotation, and it's a non-subsective <laughs> So. This is a model for how uh, how we can represent the meanings of modifiers and nouns um, and their composition. And so the question is, is this a good model that we should use and try to build into our models with the hope of building better models of language? And so the question is, is this a good prediction for human inferences? As in, uh, if I build a computational model that understands set theoretic denotations and the ways that they uh, relate to each other and class modifiers, will it be good at predicting inferences or making inferences like what humans make? Um, so we collected a set of annotations where we showed people pairs of sentences um, which differed by the insertion of a single modifier. So um, we would say something like Eddie and the cat and ask uh, whether or not uh, say like assume this first sentence is true. So we'd say assume that Eddie is a cat and then they would have to say whether it was true or false that Eddie is a domestic cat. Um, and this is going in the direction from, uh, from the noun to the modified noun, and then we also go, uh, and they can say yes or unknown, and then we also go in the reverse direction from the modified noun to the noun. Um, and we do this for lots of different pairs of modifiers and nouns and lots of different seed sentences. Um, and so getting annotations in both directions kind of allows us to reverse engineer what the underlying set theoretic uh, relationship between the noun and the modified noun would have to look like in order to produce these inference patterns, right? So <clears throat> if you say yes in the forward direction and yes in the reverse direction, in a set theoretic world, this would make sense if both of them are referring to the same set. Um, if you say that cat entails, uh, sorry, that domestic cat entails cat, but cat doesn't necessarily entail domestic cat, um, then you get this kind of normal subsective setup this, where one is a subset of the other. You could go in the reverse direction, uh, where the modified noun entails, or the noun entails the modified noun, but not vice versa. Something like the potential successor may or may, may not be the successor, but the successor was the potential successor. It's a little convoluted. Um, you can have independence relations, where, uh, which would be like so-called or alleged, where you have this overlapping but not subset relationship. Or you could have completely disjoint um, sets, where you get no in both directions. So we have these kind of five basic classics, classes of how sets might overlap with one another and what the resulting inference patterns would be in the forward and reverse direction. Um, we kind of borrowed this set of uh, relations and labels on the set threading from the work on natural logic um, that has uh, very old origins, but was worked on a lot by um, Bill McCarty in his thesis like about 10 years ago. Um, okay, so, so these are the kind of five basic sets we're expecting to see. 
um, in relation to the types of modifiers we would expect to see them in. Um, and we asked a set of people on Mechanical Turk over about 5,000 pairs of sentences. And this is the distribution of uh, patterns that we, uh, that we observed based on the inference patterns. So about 62% of the case was like unsurprising and uninteresting. So this, uh, were the inference patterns were consistent with the subsective modifiers that cat or gray cat is a cat, but a cat isn't necessarily a gray cat. Um, so nothing, nothing to see here. Um, the first kind of interesting wedge was that almost a quarter of the cases we saw that the inference in both directions was being judged as an entailment. So this would be saying that not only does gray cat entail cat, but often people were saying cat entails gray cat, at least in context. Um, and so if we look, if we try to explain this in set theoretic terms, you would say this would mean that the noun and the modified noun are referring to the same set, um, which could make sense. You could say that something like world and entire world are, you know, co-referential and that's fine. Um, but if we looked at the actual examples, very often this wasn't the case. We weren't seeing this kind of a pattern, um, but instead we were seeing a whole variety of cases. So some cases we did get something like that, like it's bill referring to entire bill, which you could kind of say like, okay, that's um, has to do with the fact that, you know, the holes are implied by default. Um, other times it was kind of de implied directly by the context, so the actual definition of the modifier was communicated by the context. Um, so if it killed 12 civilians, it was a deadly attack, so there's kind of a, a comfortable explanation that you could get away with. Uh, but then there were a lot of cases of these kinds of prototypicality judgments. So if you said 10 sheep are looking at the camera, people would infer, they would say yes, it is entailed that 10 woolly sheep are looking at the camera. And it's not the case that all sheep are woolly. I have verified this. Um, but, but these kinds of inferences were quite consistent. That uh, I don't, And I don't think that people would argue that every sheep is a woolly sheep, but they're very comfortable making this inference even when they know they don't have to, right? So if you ask them, are they woolly sheep? They're like, yes even though they could have said maybe, maybe not. Um, so we get a lot of these kinds of uh, uh, modifiers being inserted kind of by default or by assumption, um, even though they're not really justified by the underlying uh, set theoretic relationships. Um, what I think is even more interesting is if you start looking at the cases where the uh, inference suggested that the noun actually contradicted the modified noun. So here you would go from, uh, uh, it'd be like saying that cat, if Eddie is a cat, then Eddie is decidedly not a gray cat, right? Um, and this makes sense if we assume these disjoint sets, so the gun, fake gun, or beach, uh, imagined beach kind of a setting where we say that the noun and modified noun um, cannot co refer to the same things. Um, and then we would expect to get negation or get judgments of no in both directions. Um, but this is actually not what we see being the driving force behind the majority of these, uh, these contradiction judgments that we see. Instead, we see a pattern that I think is really interesting, um, which is these kinds of undefined relations. So we would see that in the, the forward direction, so if you say, does cat tail gray cat, they would say, or sorry, does gray cat tail cat, they would say yes. So going from modified noun to noun, they would say yes, which is consistent with like the subsective setting. But then the same words in the opposite direction, they would treat it as contradictory. Um, which doesn't make any sense in a set theoretic way, like that you can't really arrange sets such that one is a subset of the other, but they are disjoint. Um, so, uh, so if you look at what's going on here, it's kind of interesting. So uh, the kind of cases where we would see this would be, for example, this. So you'd say Bush travels Monday to Michigan to remark on the economy, and people, and you would ask whether he was um, remarking on the Japanese economy, and people would just say no. Not probably not. They would just say no. Um, which would mean that they would imply that in this context, economy contradicts the Japanese economy. But if you gave it in the other direction, you said he's uh, traveling to, to Michigan on Monday to remark on the Japanese economy, is he remarking on the economy? They would say yes. Um, so there was some kind of uh, pragmatic inference thing happened here where economy was assumed to mean American economy so strongly that Japanese economy was considered contradictory. Um, and this pattern we saw in these, with these kinds of subsector modifiers as well as with a lot of the primitive modifiers. Um, so this is the same pattern we saw with things like fictitious company um, or fake gun. So if you said uh, he paid debts to the company, people would say it's not a fictitious company and it would behave like a primitive. But if you said he paid debt to the fictitious company, people would say that he paid debt to the company and they seem to be like, yes, it, the company, just the fictitious one, right? So there was this kind of asymmetry in how these 
uh, patterns were being handled. Um, and so this kind of taking a step back and trying to look at uh, what this means, and again, from the point of view of trying to build computational models, is we have these classes of modifiers. We believe that there might be some way that they relate to the inferences that we make about them. And specifically, we expect that if we could organize the modifiers into these classes, we could have some priors on saying, well, subsective modifiers will usually lead to judgments of entailment, non-subsective to judgments of linked independence, and primitive to judgments of contradiction. Um, but what we actually see when we just look at sentences in the wild where we make these kinds of changes is we get a pattern that looks much more like this. So it's kind of all over the place. Um, it's defined differently under, so like it would be defined over sets of possible worlds on the full, uh, on the full sentence, right? So like you could have declarative sentences which refer to future files. So yeah, there's a little bit of um, pickiness here. So, and this is why I want to have the caveat that we're not saying that these underlying sets don't necessarily exist in somewhere in, the, in people's brains or things like that. Um, I don't, I'm not really qualified to speak on that. Um, but it's from the point of view of saying, I need to build a model that will make predictions. And so as a starting point, you could say, well, if I know that a sentence is true of gray cats, I should, uh, or if I know that um, a person is a gray cat, I should be able to infer that they are a cat generally in most contexts. Um, and being able to not make that jump, um, even if it's like there is some set theoretic notion, but then it's being outweighed by all these pragmatic considerations from the point of view of trying to build the model, um, basically the concern is that we would be starting by knowing we're already gonna make a ton of incorrect predictions at the beginning, and then we'd have to work on building the machinery to, to run on top of the output of these predictions, right? So I think this is kind of where we're uh, ending, which is that we have these, uh, we have something we know how to codify, which is we could write these kinds of set theoretic rules um, granted, it's really hard to do that, so we have not achieved uh, any models that could like fully parse the sentences and reason about them in a set theoretic way. Um, but then I think even if we could, we'd still be in a starting point where a lot of the predictions would be wrong because of these pragmatic factors. And so then we'd have to feed this into another system, which will then fix those errors or run on top of it. And that's a piece that we don't quite know how to codify yet. Um, so I think this is a, a somewhat a stressful place to be standing in, where you're saying, uh, skipping ahead, where we're saying, um, I have, I want to build a better model of language. I can start from kind of our best model that we have, um, and if I were to implement it perfectly, I would still see a lot of errors in the types of predictions it would be making. Um, so then, kind of take another step back and say, well, does this really matter from the point of view of? people in machine learning computational linguistics because maybe this is that kind of falling off the overly philosophical uh, deep end or maybe this is something better left to people who study uh, language in the brain because we can just say let's just learn it without having to write down exactly what the model is. So maybe given enough examples of adjective noun pairs and the sentences they appear in and the inferences, we can train a model to just learn the representation that allows you to make this prediction. Um, so we did try doing that where we trained it several, I mean, there's much more state-of-the-art models at the time or now than there were two years ago back in the day. Um, but at the time, these were kind of competitive models for doing natural language uh, entailment, and we tried some kind of more uh, featureized and uh, supervised models, some, uh, I guess they're all supervised models, but some more like uh, traditional featureized models, some kind of partially rule-based models that worked on transformations between strings and doing these partially proof-based types of things, um, and some deep learning models, including one where we did a transfer learning setup because we only had about 5,000 training pairs, which can be not quite enough to uh, train deep learning models. So we pre-trained on half a million uh, SNLI sentences and then fine-tuned on our adjective noun data. And we're still seeing just basically at random performance on this task, um, which basically suggesting that if we just don't think about the problem when we say, I'm sure the model can learn it, um, that's not necessarily the case. So we're not getting the right representation for free necessarily, um, which brings back to this notion of, well, we have to decide what the model is that we want. If we try to write it down and implement it, we're gonna have to deal with all of these other error, uh, 
of shortcomings of set theoretic semantics that linguists have been dealing with and we don't yet have a good I can write it down in code solution for yet. Um, and we can't just learn it for free. So we're kind of back at this, uh, this epic crossroads of we don't have the right representations and we're not quite sure yet how to get them. Um, and so I, I don't know if I should pause for questions before I kind of launch into other, I think I'll pause here. Yeah. So I, I agree with you, except that then there's the intuition is kind of easy to propose and then formalizing it as hard, right? So saying that I have a prototype and, and being able to uh, then enumerate all of the things that you would then be, um, you would like all of that, for example, attributes that a beach might have and assigning probabilities to the prototype. Like, does that exist? Is it only realized in natural language at task time, or does it exist at some lower point? So I think kind of formalizing what is it, what is the representation? Like, set is a crisp representation that you can abstract away nicely. Um, prototype is harder, and especially in the case that you want to not only be able to do this soft matching between language, but you want to refer to the world, right? So I want a representation of language that allows me to say, beaches are similar to snowy beaches, but also that's a snowy beach. And that isn't the snowy beach, right? Like being able to do both of those things is something that I, I'm not yet aware of, like a, a crisp definition of how I could like write that down in Python. I, I really like multitask learning. I think that as a general rule sounds like a really promising direction to go in because you do need, like it seems very well motivated that our language has, has been optimized to serve many purposes and it was, and having those constraints built into training time makes a ton of sense. I do think there's sensitivity to the tasks that it's being trained to do. So for example, right now, if I were just to take all of the tasks for which there are currently available data sets, I don't know that they're sufficiently dissimilar from each other to really give the benefits of that, right? So say you have to do sentiment analysis and uh, like topic classification or something isn't necessarily like two or completely orthogonal tasks that will incentivize what some deep model of you know reference and knowledge representation to be embedded in there because I think you get away with similar heuristics on many of the different tasks. Um, but I do think that as a framework, I'm bullish on multitasking. But uh, interesting. Oh, it's um, it's somewhere around like ninety-seven or something. It's in the nineties. It's not perfect. And actually, the next section I'm going to go into human annotation disagreement, and that's where I've gotten distracted for a while because it's it's a problem. Yeah. Um, yeah, so like polysemy or just general lexical uncertainty, I think also uh, very problematic. So one of the reasons for having these annotated in context is adding context to the sentence adds uh, certain issues where it's like there are other things that can prevent the set theoretic model from behaving correctly. Um, for example, like negations and quantifier scopes. So if I say something like uh, uh, Eddie is a cat, Eddie is a gray cat, um, the entailment says Eddie is a gray cat and tails Eddie is a cat. But if I say there are no cats in the room, it implies there are no gray cats in the room. Right? So like adding in context can mess up the annotation. At the same time, removing context also messes up the annotation because then you have issues like polysemy. So when you have context, a sentence in context, usually the polysemy was not a huge issue because there's enough context to disambiguate. 
Um, so I think we saw less issues with less me on this annotation, um, and hopefully the models had they had access to the full sentence, so they didn't have those issues. Um, but we introduced other compounds by having full sentences, so it's not perfect. Um, and again, I'll talk about that a bit in the next section. Annotation. Cool. Then I want to talk about annotation because it's coming up anyway. Um, so I said we kind of. Uh, ideally want to be in this situation where we're saying, I have some model for how language works and I'm going to build it into my representation. Um, but what we actually have is a kind of harder or deeper picture, which is that we don't actually know what the model is. We're trying to figure that out, which means we have some idea of what the model is. We have to figure out how to instantiate it and then we have to figure out how to evaluate it and that requires some task. Um, and so what we had used in the kind of set theoretic notion, we're being a bit unfair to it because this definition of what the model of entailment is, um, was designed with the idea of modeling logical entailment, like the task was to model logical entailment, but then we're evaluating against human inferences, which is not quite the same thing. Um, so now we want to kind of call into question, well, what is the right model to be building? Um, and if we're going to do that, we first have to agree on, like, what is the right evaluation, right? So right now we're saying we want whatever model allows us to mimic human inferences under the hope that if we do that well, then that will be somewhat general purpose across the tasks that we might care about. Um, but then actually figuring out how to, what it means to say model human inferences is itself quite hard. Um, and so that's uh, something I've been looking at uh, recently, is this notion of how are we defining the task of entailment. So the kind of set theoretic definition, and again, I'm being unfair to it because this is not actually a, um, was not proposed as a task, this is like a definition, right? In, in logic, they're saying this is what it means to entail something, right? Um, is that P entails H if uh, P is true in every possible world where H is true, um, or sorry, H is true in every possible world where P is true. What we do in NLP is we say, I don't know exactly what the definition of entailment is that people are using, so I'm just gonna say, let's, let's see what people do and let's try to mimic that without telling them what it means for something to, for one sentence to entail another. So what we com commonly use in NLP is the Ido Gagan definition, which is pitched and intended to be very vague. So we just say that a premise entails a hypothesis. If a person reading a premise would infer that the hypothesis is true, uh, assuming human understanding of language as well as background knowledge. So basically just like if people say that the premise entails a hypothesis, then that's the thing we're trying to model. Like um, and we don't have, we're not gonna tell them what it means to entail, just let them go with their gut. Um, actually, the definition that Degan used was very heavily hedged. So it said, uh, premise entails a hypothesis if typically a person reading the premise would infer that the hypothesis is most likely true, um, assuming common human understanding of language and common background knowledge. So it's, it's acknowledged that we don't really know what's happening here and there's some kind of gisting happening, but we want to model this, um, this un poorly understood process by which people draw conclusions about natural language, or from natural language and render them into natural language. Um, and so we have to deal with this notion of what does it mean for something to be like probably most likely true given a premise. Um, and we kind of want to model it as some probability. So we want to say something that's softer where we're like, okay, what is the probability that this hypothesis would be true? What is the probability of a beach being sandy given that it's a beach and some common understanding of the world we'll see? Um, and then like threshold this and say, this is a sufficiently high probability, therefore people infer it as an entailment. Um, but this isn't even something we can actually observe. Like we don't get, to, there's no way to get at what is the probability of this hypothesis being inferred to be entailed by the premise. All we can do is ask lots and lots of people and say yes or no, is this hypothesis true? And then try to aggregate them in some way and then say, let's try to predict that. Um, and so this is what I think is actually a really big can of worms that should, we should be paying more attention to um, if we want to try to make progress on modeling these kinds of human inferences. So uh, you can start by saying, well, we're, we're in a pretty good case if people tend to agree with each other. Um, so we took a couple sentences from the Stanford Natural Language Inference data set, which is a big intelligent data set. Um, they had on their test set five judgments per sentence pair, so here's two sentence pairs. Um, a guy in a yellow shirt performs a balancing act on a taut chain near a canal, and you ask whether a boy is doing a trick by the water. Um, the second one says a young woman stands by a barbecue, and you ask whether the young female is near a machine. 
Um, and they asked five people, and these are the distributions of answers that they got from those five people. So very contentious, no one knows whether this privacy entails this hypothesis. Um, now it's a sample of five, and it's crowdsourcing, and it's like a noisy process, so some people might be explicitly man malicious, some people might just be lazy or not understand the direction, some people might like sneeze and click the wrong button, like you don't really know, so you get this noise. Um, so we took these examples and we collected uh, many more, like 30 or 50 more annotations, and said, what does the distribution look like then? And you can see in some cases, it does appear to be noise, and this variation drops down, and people seem to agree that there's no entailment here. But on this side, um, it seems to still be hotly contested whether a barbecue should be referred to as a machine, um, with about half the people saying neutral and half the people saying entailment. Um, so this, uh, so what do we do about this? Like, what do we do when there's consistent disagreement among people? And um, what we usually do in practice is take a majority vote. Um, and so I'll point out that there are multiple places where we might have uncertainty into the annotation process, right? So we can have individual people who are not sure what the right answer is, and then we can have disagreement among different people. Um, and, the, and in the current way we do it is we just take majority vote, which means we ignore that the person is individually uncertain, we make them make a judgment, and then we aggregate across people, and we ignore that people are collectively uncertain and we just pick majority. So currently we would say something like, if every single person says that there's a 60% chance of entailment, then that counts as a 100% chance of entailment. Um, if two people say there's a 100% chance of entailment, and one person says there's a 100% chance of uh, contradiction, then that's a, a two-thirds chance of entailment. Um, if everyone's kind of unsure across the board, but they're breaking the tie in favor of contradiction, then that counts as 100% chance of contradiction. So it's kind of a mess. And it's easy to criticize, to be like, oh, that seems wrong, but it's actually hard to say what is the right answer here. Um, so we can think about, I think, kind of like two important models. And uh, I think, it's worth emphasizing, so there's, so these aren't models for what is happening when people make the entailment judgment. There's a lot of good work on that kind of a thing, which is saying, what is making these people uncertain? Is it because of polysemy? Is it because of a, a uncertainty about the context? Is it because of um, uh, certain pragmatic inferences that are, are not being shared across speakers and listeners? We, we're not actually going to think about that yet. We're just saying, how should we define this task? Which um, means, like, how are we going to say whether or not a model's predictions agree with human judgments? Well, human judgments have to be collected across a lot of people. Um, so this is just saying how do we model the task of entailment, putting aside a fact, for a second the fact that we will then have to use that task to judge these much more complex models of entailment. So if we're going to just look at the task, I think there's two kind of important categories we should break things into. One is that there is that entailment is predominantly a signal that lives within the premise and the hypothesis, and so we would expect that there is a true label, and when we observe disagreement, it's noise around that true label. Um, so, you know, here it really should be the case that the correct, le correct label is neutral, but people are going to provide a noisy signal around that. So we have some function of premise and hypothesis and some noise term that might be annotator specific. Um, separately, we could say something different, which is that the the entailment is primarily actually defined between, or it's defined as a listener's interpretation of the premise and the, or the hypothesis relative to the premise. And in that case, the true label will change depending on the person. And so saying that a model is a, a matches human judgments would mean that it has to be able to anticipate these differences across people as well. Um, and so there we would say the true label for person one and two is different, and the true label for person three is different, and that uh, the listener is explicitly a part of this definition. Um, and so it's hard, we can't really say which of the right, which of these is right, so we're just trying to look at what kind of behavior would we expect under one uh, model or the other and, um, and try to get an indication as to which would be a better definition to be using. Um, so let's take this assumption, which would be like kind of the nicer assumption, which is that there is some consistent label between P and H and um, everything else we are observing is noise around that label. Um, and so we can model these as, if we're going to ask many annotators, we can model this as kind of a mixture of multinomials that will, ex uh, that will show us different types of um, noise patterns around this 
assumed true label. So uh, for this data, I'll say we collected, uh, uh, how many layers of sentences did we have? I forget exactly how many, but maybe, uh, a couple thousand sentences with 30 labels per uh, pair. And then we look at the distribution of human judgments, um, and everyone is labeling on a five-point scale, where one is definitely contradiction, and five is definitely entailment, and uh, three is neutral, and then you can kind of split the difference. Um, so in a really simple model, we can say that the noise is just randomly distributed. There's a true label, which is, uh, uh, which is the annotator chooses with some probability p, and then there is, otherwise they take a random guess around the other labels. Um, we could do a slightly more complex model where we say there's some Gaussian distribution, so there's some true label, which is the mean, um, and then there's some standard deviation around that, and the person just samples from this Gaussian um, and then maps it onto our discrete uh, Likert scale. Um, and then, like, kind of our most sympathetic model would be saying, like, we just we take these 30 judgments per thing, and the uh, and the disagreement distribution we see for each label is the multinomial, like that defines the multinomial, so some labels are more uh, contentious than others, and so we would expect to see different disagreement patterns for contradictions, for example, versus neutrals. So we just say you're sampling from this multinomial, which we assign those probabilities based on what we observe humans to be doing. Um, and so the way we evaluate the kind of fitness of these models is we're saying, uh, we have some assumed model, and then we have a, for a particular sentence, we have the disagreement pattern um, of the 30 annotations we got for that sentence, and we're just saying what is the probability of drawing this observation if this is the underlying model. Um, and we're going to assign a probability using the usual multinomial probability for that. Um, and then the kind of significance of this observation is the probability of observing this observation or anything less likely under the model. So this is the kind of multinomial test for or how to assign a p-value to a specific observation for an arbitrary multinomial. Um, and so what we would expect for like statistically well-distributed data is that these p-values would kind of fall along the y equals x line. So you know, 20% of samples are being assigned a p-value of less than or equal to 20, and 50% less than or equal to 50, et cetera. Um, and these are the different models that we were looking at. So the kind of point here is uh, like kind of to have something to grab onto is that like for our best model, it's still assigning 30% of the observations of probability of less than or equal to 5% likelihood. Um, and it's basically just suggesting that these are not very good fits for what we're observing. So these kind of different noise patterns don't really give a good explanation of the particular disagreement patterns that we are seeing on the individual uh, sentence pairs. Um, and I will, as an aside, say the issue of context. So we looked at, well, maybe this is partially due to the fact that people don't have a lot of context when they're looking at these sentences and they're having to guess, and maybe if we add in more context, then people will converge on a similar interpretation of the words and we'll see something that looks like a more consistent noise pattern or something that looks more consistent, like premise hypothesis signal plus annotator noise. Um, so we tried collecting at different levels of granularity, so we had single sentences and then um, full paragraphs, and we had words, sentences, and paragraphs, um, and as an anecdotal example, although I have more um, quantitative examples, we actually saw that agreement was highest at the word level. So if you said chartreuse and pink and had people label that as entailment, contradiction, neutral, whatever, they would mostly say that these are contradictory terms. Um, if you gave them a bit of a sentence, there was some more uh, noise and people kind of skewed towards maybe entailment but neutral. And then when you gave them a full paragraph, then they spread out even more. Um, so this is something I'm interested in following up on, but it, we did kind of see that this trend where people maybe gravitate to the same kind of prototypical explanation at a lower level, but then as you gave more context, they had more freedom of how to interpret things and how to read into things at a higher or lower level. Um, so we actually saw disagreement uh, increase as context increased. Um, so again, I'll kind of step back. Um, so the issue here is that we're seeing a lot of um, disagreement in the annotation at the human level, and we're not yet reflecting that in the way that we evaluate the systems that we're building. So it's hard to say whether my model of language is better than your model of language because my model captures human judgments better when we haven't really decided what it means to be capturing human judgments or what is that metric that we're trying to um, that we're trying to see performance improve on. 
Um, and so you can say that actually our models, specifically our deep models, are really good at capturing uncertainty already because they have this notion of softmax. And if we're doing a classification problem, we can just train it and we'll get the uncertainty um, pushed all the way down to the prediction at the end. Um, so we did try training some models to just do this entailment prediction, but they get to predict over many different human labels and they can predict a distribution over entailment judgments. And maybe that will capture the uncertainty that we see in humans kind of for free without us having to do anything special. Um, and so we used what was currently the state of the art on, um, on the SNLI data set or state of the art combined with easiest to re-implement, but it was a competitive model for, uh, for this um, data set. And we tried just comparing how well these softmax predictions of the class are matched to the distributions we were seeing in humans. Um, and very often we saw that these, these were not the same thing. These weren't the same probability of distribution, right? So in, for example, in this case, we saw that humans were quite confident that it was neutral, that something could be traded on to stock exchange, or sorry, the model thinks that uh, it can be traded on two stock exchanges at once, whereas humans were split, where some were like, maybe they can be on two at once, and others were like, you tend to only be traded on one stock exchange, or maybe you can only be traded on one stock exchange. I actually don't know. Um, here you see that the opposite is true, that humans are quite sure that this is contradictory, that you can't be both east and west of the town at the same time, whereas the model is assigning a decent amount of problem the best in the case that this might be neutral. Um, and then you can see where the skews just go opposite. So here people uh, largely think that if the, uh, the Japanese began and ended agriculture, they probably didn't begin and end communication in the community. Um, so there's kind of a, maybe it's true, but skewed towards contradiction, whereas the model skews towards entailment. Um, so the takeaway here just being that Again, this isn't something we necessarily get for free. The fact that we're modeling entailment as a probability distribution doesn't mean it's necessarily the right probability distribution or that, um, or that we can interpret it in a way that we might want to interpret or that we would know how to interpret that probability distribution that we're getting out. Um, so I will wrap up because I'm out of time anyway. Um, so kind of the broad takeaway is the way I've been thinking about what we're currently working on uh, in natural language processing is essentially that we are we have stumbled into the problems that linguists have been thinking about for a while, which is that representing language is hard and uh, figuring out exactly what it is we're trying to represent and trying to write that and codify it um, is really challenging and it's not something that just uh, we get for free by training on data. Um, and this is something we have to care about, and we have to care about it because we're no longer claiming to be an engineering field, which primarily is optimizing for tasks, and now we want to build things that are general purpose and intrinsically sound. Um, and this is something that's been studied for a while, and there are insights we can get from other uh, fields about uh, how to do this and what types of problems arise when you try to do this. Um, but then I will add my caveats, which is, I think there's a lot we can learn from linguistics about process, and I think that there's a lot of um, questions that we are going to confront that other people have spent time thinking about or considering. Um, but that doesn't mean that they have answers. This isn't the case of like, we don't know how to represent this and the linguists do, so let's take their models and implement them. Um, instead, it's the case that we're, we're now addressing similar problems to what other people have been studying. Um, and so there should be much more collaboration and dialogue there about the, the actual goals of trying to represent language in a general purpose way are now shared. Um, and we can't just assume that, like, I think sometimes uh, data-driven gets used as like a, something that is hard to criticize. Like no one is saying you should ignore what the data says, but they, being data-driven doesn't mean you're gonna get the right model out for free. Um, so your models have to be consistent with the data, and the data should inform the models that you're using, but it's not the case that whatever predicts the data is necessarily the right model, as we can see by how easy it is to break these. Um, and I also think that sometimes probabilistic gets used as a bit of a, a no one, did, uh, not no one, but it's, it's easy to say things should be probabilistic and it's hard to find people who will disagree with you, but there are many places to build probability into these and they're not all the same. So I think being precise about where the probability distributions are and what, how they are supposed to be interpreted um, is kind of really necessary step in order to have like these kind of productive conversations and um, comparisons going forward. 
in these different models of how language works. Um, I was going to thank my, uh, so a lot of the work on adjective nouns sequence with my advisor, uh, Chris Kalsenberg, during my PhD. Um, and then the later stuff on disagreement was with some of my collaborators at Google. Um, and then I have all these awesome new students who just joined me at Brown. So they will be the ones who are actually like pushing this forward. So I want to throw up their faces. Erin is an alumni of here. He wanted me to say hi to all of you. Thank you very much. Well, probably. I would say not. Um, and I would, it'd be interesting to look at, but I think that gets to the real question of what is it we're trying to model. So if you're, if we want to be able to have arguments about which model is better, we need like a model neutral. And, and I think linguists, right, so you say, I want to model what humans do, right? Not, I want to model what humans who believe my model agree is the correct output of my model. So we kind of want a sense of what would a human do in this context? Um, and in that case, I think linguists are not human. <laughs> There's like, that we want human annotations or we want linguistic annotations. But, so I think that there's, um, so I think if you tell people, when I say entailment, I need this, they, you could train them and get consistent judgments. But presumably, we, that's not what we want to predict. We want the best case, like, like we're trying to cheat and get into the head of a person just like read a sentence and now they're drawing conclusions and if I ask them later something natural language they would either agree with me as that's consistent with what I read or they would disagree with me and be like whoa that contradicts what I read. We're trying to prox for that process, um, right? So, we're, so it's more about what are the inferences that people are making and how do they manifest through natural language because that's the task that we can actually work on.